Thanks for joining us for an Every Nation Sunday Sermon. This message is from our Hammersmith congregation. For more information on our church, or to see how you can be involved, please visit everynation.co.uk. Are there any Manchester United fans in the house? Man, you played uh, Sheffield United yesterday and won, what was the score? 1-0 1-0 in the, like, the final minute through a penalty. And, you know, someone made a comment. One of the pundits made an made a observation about Man United. And this is what he said. He said, Man United players looked bored. And friends, as I heard that, I said, Oh, God, help us as Christians, as church, as the people of God. Never, never, ever should anybody say of us, We looked bored, or we were bored, with Christ, with the gospel, with the truth, in this being disciples of Jesus. Can you imagine a disciple of Jesus, one of the twelve, and someone commenting as these guys with Christ walked through their world, and somebody looked at them and said, oh, those guys looked bored. Never. And as we look at this series, we're doing just uh, these three weeks before we get to our Vision Focus Sunday on the 24th, we're doing this series looking at Nehemiah and looking at some truth, some lessons from this man's life on how we can live purposefully, how we can live not bored but fully alive, how we can live moved. And our great example, while we're going to look some lessons out of Nehemiah, our great example is Jesus himself. As he walked through the world, the Bible says that as he saw the crowd, as he saw this world he came to engage with, it says he was moved with compassion, and then he healed and he delivered and he saved and he went all the way to the cross. Jesus, he, he, moved, he, he ministered out of a moving of with compassion. And in the original, that word moved, that phrase moved with compassion really is one word that really means to be moved from the inward parts. Kind of really to live from the heart, a heart that's, that, that, that is touched by what it sees, what it experiences, what it's observed. And church, we want to be a people this year that live moved and not bored. Somebody say, Amen. I just nudge the person next to you say, I'm not going to live boring. Before we get to Nehemiah, I want to take you to a little story, a story of a woman who just exemplifies in some way what it looks like to live moved. And this, her name's Melissa Day, and this is what it says. This is from the stewardship, um, who we work a lot with, great charity. It says, um, this, is, this is Melissa Day, a woman who lives in Ipswich, just in Suffolk over there, and it says this, closed borders, dispersed families, and desperate people fleeing persecution and death. These images have defined so much of the news of late. Would you agree? Okay, so we see this stuff happening around us. In the face of such large issues, it's easy to wonder what difference one person can make. What difference can I make? What can we make? This is a prayer. We're praying at the church, as a church. What difference can we make? Uh, Melissa Day, an Ipswich businesswoman, decided to do more than simply wonder. It started in 2008 when Melissa chose to find out for herself what, was like, what life was like as immigrants and asylum seekers. Through a friend at an immigration removal, removal center, she met an asylum seeker from Zimbabwe who was fleeing Mugabe's regime. Speaking to this man, a primary school teacher, opened her eyes to the loss of dignity suffered by many asylum seekers. This man was a well-educated, a cultured man. English is not his second language, but his fifth language. He asked me, can you imagine what it feels like to ask for blue paper, toilet paper? Can you, just, just this basic need I have, an educated man. So meeting this man led Melissa to run an event. She called people together. Something moved her to get into action. So she started things up. Soon MPs were lending their support. Then one congregation, uh, one of the congregation told her that they had a spare room. And this person said, well, I'd love to host the refugee. That kind of built up. And soon she was having a meeting. And in a meeting where she shared a vision, she, she had a businessman come to her and said, I'll pay a year's rent for a house for us as a church to house asylum seekers. 
And so it went on. It says with the a, with a recent Syrian refugee crisis um, prevalent in the news, she says, I was invited onto the BBC radio. She shared this. Fifteen couples contacted her out of that and said, we have a room. We'll host somebody. In the meantime, she started, a, she realized that one of the great needs was people couldn't speak English. Not everybody's fifth language was, was English. Uh, or, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> they agreed to let me start. So they started this English conversation group on Tuesdays, although they weren't really convinced anyone would come. Anyone ever started something and weren't convinced it's going to work? You know, it's half the battle, half the victory is just showing up, friends. Most people, most of us don't get done what we want to do or feel we should do just because we don't show up. We don't take the first step. She showed up. Everybody said nobody's going to pitch up. And when they arrived, 15 young people were queuing outside the venue. The group's gone from strength to strength, and the attendants have gone, have, uh, attendance have formed a five-a-side football team. Melissa had no doubt that one person can make a difference. Her vision has led to Ipswich becoming a town sanctuary and many refugees being made to feel welcome and safe. It's been at a cost, though. The local paper ran an interview with me when I started the project. I received hate mail, death threats, and my house and my car were, were uh, targeted. When we step out, it's going to be with a cost, right? I mean, not everybody is happy when you try to make a difference. <coughs> of late, however, there's been a shift. Every night I pray to God to use me as a channel for His work. This is her prayer. There is a spiritual shift in our culture. There is a light in the darkness. Friend, this is Melissa Day's story. A woman who started looking just up from her, beyond herself and her business and said, What's going on in my world? And she was moved. And as she moved from, from, from the inside out and started doing something, this is an amazing story. Wouldn't you agree? I think we should give Melissa Day and those like her a big hand. Now, last week we joined with Nehemiah, and we want to learn from this man quickly. I'm going to try and keep this really short, and then we're going to, we're going to learn from him. How did he get moved? And we hear these inspirational stories from Melissa Day and others. How did, how, did, how did Nehemiah get moved? And what does that show us as, as to how we can get moved and live moved and see God do amazing things? Because this man, Nehemiah, this is how the book starts. Nehemiah is an Old Testament prophet. And uh, this is how it starts. It tells us he was in a city, a place called Susa, and he was a king's cupbearer. So last week uh, we said, listen, let's invite, let's, let's recognize our now. Okay, let's, let's be realistic about where we are now. You're in London, the greatest city in the world. <laughs> he was a cupbearer. I don't know what you're doing. What's your job? Maybe you don't have a job, but this is your now. And we said we've got to face our now before we can make a difference. We move from where we are, not from where somewhere we hope to be, right? We, we start with where we are, and that's the, that's the only place you can start. And we encourage each other. Let's invite Jesus into our now. Whether you feel that your now is challenging, whether you're very comfortable in your cupbearing job in the greatest city in the world, then don't live just challenged or comfortable. Live called. God, I'm here for your purposes. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I think this is the best place we can start to say, God, here I am. Like Ananias said, we look at, here I am, Lord. I'm signed up for your purposes. Friend, I believe that's the place to start. This is where, where Nehemiah started. And friend, you might have lots of stuff going on. You might have disappointments. You might have challenges. I'm here to tell you, don't let your disappointments of last year keep you from God's appointments this year. Let me say that again. Don't let your disappointments from last year keep you from God's appointments this year. Don't let your faith be shaped by the wilderness. Let it be shaped by God's word. Be renewed every day. So Nehemiah finds himself in the place, in this place, but he wasn't alone in this world. I mean, he's in a comfortable place, but there was lots going on in his world. And friends, wherever we find ourselves, let's recognize there's a lot going on in our world. I mean, if you, know, if you just go and read the Bible before Nehemiah, you get who? In the Bible, the book? Ezra. Okay, so in Ezra, and after Nehemiah, you get? Esther, and then Job, all right? So Ezra and Ezra, Nehemiah and Ezra were, were contemporaries. Nehemiah had a vision and a call of God to go and rebuild 
the temple in Jerusalem. So, so the whole news cast, every news feed was filled with posts about, about this idea that the temple is being rebuilt in Jerusalem. And anyone following it very closely, the temple's being rebuilt. And one day, one of Nehemiah's brothers come to visit him, and this is what he says. It's, he says this, Hananiah, oh, oh, oh. Han Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I asked them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, because, you know, the history there, that Israel had been exiled, had been taken into captivity, and now there was this move of not everybody, but a some remnant going back to rebuild. You know, not everybody's going to come with us on the journey, right? Don't think that the only thing we're going to do is when everybody says we agree. Okay. It's not about democracy, it's you having a vision, us having a vision, and saying, we're going, who's coming? Okay. <laughs> and so anyway, this is happening. He asked them, what's going on in Jerusalem? I've heard that Ezra and the guys are building the temple. What's going on? They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem... Has bro is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. You see, the temple might be being rebuilt, but the walls and the city are in ruins. And friend, it doesn't just take revival, it takes rebuilding. This doesn't take just one man doing something or one group doing something. Listen, every one of us have got something to do to bring this transformation of Jesus, to bring the kingdom in. He doesn't say, oh, great, Ezra is doing something about it. No, he recognizes that I can also do something about it. And one of the things we must not do is just let everybody else do all the good stuff. Think everybody else is making a difference. He says, listen, and, and, and so, so this is the news he hears. And listen, he hears it. What does he do? It says he asks them. I want to encourage us. If we're going to live, move, let's not just sit there observing things. Let's lean in a bit, Right? He's not like, oh, I've heard and talk about what is happening. He leans in and he's interested. He's curious. He's, he, he wants to know more. He's concerned, right? And friends, I want to encourage you as Christians, let's not live like this, leaning away from everything that's going on in our world, right? Let's live like this, leaning into what's going on in my world. That's the way we're going to get moved. Not just like I'm comfortable or I'm leaning back. Let's lean in and say, God. And let's observe, let's not watch the news and just let it go past us like this. And as we look at our world, friend, here's a picture of a city in Syria. This is the destruction, friend, that's happening all over our world. As you look at that picture that you've seen many, many, many of in the news, what, what's our response to that sort of stuff? What moves us? Here's one of the challenges, you know. Why don't we, why aren't we moved anymore? <laughs> why aren't we moved anymore? On the one hand, I think we're just overwhelmed. Like, I mean, can we really do anything about this? We're overwhelmed. A million, a million refugees <coughs> marching towards us. Can we, re so we're overwhelmed. On the other hand, we might just be selfish. Like, let, let me build my walls around my house and my life and my job, and I hope this doesn't affect me. You know, the, they, they have identified a, or coined a term for why we don't do anything, why we are not moved any longer, and it's called compassion fatigue. It's a term that describes that when you've had so much bombardment of need and crises coming at you through your eye gates, your ear gates, you, you just, you know, I suppose it's like a doctor. It's like... Anne-Marie, when she describes what she experiences in hospital, and, and the stuff you must see there, I don't know if you've ever been to A&E for something, but the stuff you just see in the few minutes that you sit there, or three hours you sit there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just kind of think, what, what is a doc? You get compassion fatigue, friend, and we've got to be careful that we don't get compassion fatigue. Jesus did not get compassion fatigue. We've got to stay close to the heart of God. We've got to hear His heartbeat all the time. We've got to stay close to knowing what's, what's on His heart and stay there. That's the way we're going to overcome com compassion fatigue. The other thing we've got to be careful of is when we have a vision, 
When we have a mission as a church, and our mission is to, we exist to glorify God by making disciples and making a difference on campus, in the city, in communities, and in the nations through church planting all across Europe. When we have those words, and they no longer move us, they are just words that have no meaning. When we talk about campus, and we say campus ministry, and community action, and, and church planting, and, and, and the transformation in the city, and making disciples, and making a difference, and the glory of God, when, when we can get fatigued with those words too. They can just become words coming out of our mouths. We've locked them in there. I'll wake you up. What's this church about? This church exists for the glory of God. Make disciples. Make a difference. Uh, campus. What's the other one? City. Uh, community. Oh, and church one. And when those things don't move us anymore, friend, we won't live in We live bored. We have all the information. It's like when this Bible is in your head, but it's not moving your heart. It's when you know the truth, but you don't walk in it. When this word, when we become bored with the Bible, and friend, we've got to watch that. And today, as we just go into a little bit further with this before we praise and worship and pray together for a good while today, I want to just trust that God will revive our hearts to what He's called us to, what He's put in front of us, that we will be moved for the campuses of this nation. Why? Because the, the, the future leaders of our nation and our societies on our campuses right now, they need to know the King and they need to become representatives of the Kingdom into every sphere of society. The universities of Western Europe are probably the darkest spiritual places on this planet. And we have a point to play to make a difference. This city, this city, friend, we need to be moved with a city that's given over to its idols. We are not here just to reap the pound or rape the pound from the city. We pray for the city. We are moved like Paul for the city, given over to its idols of materialism, of secularism, of selfishness, of pride, of power. We need to be moved in the city. Our community, the brokenness around us, friend, let's be moved by it. Let's walk through. And, 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 and when we look at what Nehemiah did, it says, it says this. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. He sat down. That means something stopped him. What will stop us? He wept. When last have we wept for something? Have we wept for a campus? Have we wept for a, our brokenness around us? Have we wept for the city? Have we wept for Europe? I don't know if you need tears streaming down your eyes, but friend Jesus, when he saw Lazarus, when he saw the brokenness, when he saw the pain, the short, shortest verse in the Bible is he wept. He was moved. I don't, know, I, don't know, again, I don't know if tears need to flow, but that would be a good thing for some of us. Tears flowing for something. I heard a, I heard a story at the beginning of December, just one ago I was watching the news. There's a little news piece about this Syrian family. They had two young children who had arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, if you know my story, I've got, I, at the age of 18, my body just from being a, a, a healthy, strong athlete to within a few weeks, my body was riddled with arthritis, came from nowhere, stayed with me for, for years and years and years. I know what it's like to be that, that kind of pain. This family had two kids and they, they showed these kids in their pain. And then the husband was killed, then the hospital was bombed, the ISIS wouldn't let the woman go out on her own to go and find help for these kids. They had to flee and I thought, I've been thinking, I can't get rid of this thought. Where are those kids? Because I guess just because you're moving from your city doesn't mean you leave your pain behind. Where, when I see that crowd of people at some border, I'm thinking, those kids are somewhere. They are in pain. I know what it feels like. I weep for those. What, what stays with us? He wept. And this, then he had this response. He didn't just go and make a plan. He wanted to make a plan, but this is what it says. It says, for some days I mourned. I mourned, and I prayed, and I fasted before the God of heaven. And this is what we want to do. We want to be moved with the things that God wants us to be moved by. We have eyes to see. We want to lean in, and when we do, we want to, we want to have compassion, and out of compassion, we want to pray, and we want to fast. And this is what we're doing this, this week. This is what we're doing this week. So let me, let me just ask us, 
We're going to be fasting this week, Monday to Friday. Is he excited about that? Yeah. I don't particularly like fasting. Why do we fast? We fast, Jesus fasted. Jesus said about his disciples, when you fast, not if you decide to fast sometime. When you fast. We fast because we're hungry. We are hungry for stuff that this world cannot give us. We are hungry for what the food and the entertainment and our, our pleasures and our, and, our, and our appetites in this world cannot satisfy. So we, we fast when we say no to those things. We say, no, 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 flesh, you are not enough. World, you are not enough for me. I need to sometimes say no to these things. I need to close the door on them and say, God, I want to just get a new perspective. I want to, I want to, be, I want to be fulfilled by you. My food, Jesus said, is to do the work of the Father and to finish the work that he's called us to do. Now, how are you going to fast? I guess most of us, most of people, you're not going to fast for five days, abstaining for food for five days. That'll be tough in your job. Some of you can do that. It's been done possible. Greater things have been done in life. <laughs> but I want to challenge us as a church. And if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower, just, just apply this to your own life. Because saying no to some stuff in life generally is a good, a good discipline to make you realize what you have got and etc. Fasting is a great discipline. Saying no to some things, your appetites for a while is a great thing. Great discipline. Very helpful. But choose your fast. Will you fast for a day? Will you fast for the same meal every day for five days? Will you fast from social media? Will you fast from TV? Will you fast from entertainment? What, what, what fast will you choose? We have a great resource for you this year. A, a fasting devotional takes us through the five days, gives you great tips, gives you some places where you can make, decide, make decisions. Don't wake up tomorrow morning and decide what you're going to fast. Okay? I know you will not what decision you're going to make. After breakfast, I'll begin to fast. <laughs> Right. Make a decision this evening. Go and download that, that, uh, that devotional and just read through it. The theme is daring to believe. We're going to believe big in this house. We, we don't want to be boring. We want to dream big in this house. And, and I trust it's going to really help you if you're using this all around the world in our every nation family. So, so just find the motivation to fast there. Choose your fast. Um, Stretch yourself a little bit. If you are a follower of Jesus, just stretch your... What, what, what's, what have you done in the past? Can you, can you stretch yourself a little bit? Okay, that would be good. So let's, let's choose our fast this week. Let's enter in. Let's believe together. Fasting empowers us to pray. Fasting is not about twisting God's arm. God, we need something, so we're going to fast and you're going to give it. Fasting actually prepares us. We do something now that prepares us for what God wants to do with us in the future. Fasting isn't about a need I have now, now I'm going to fast quickly to motivate God. No, fasting is about preparing me for what's coming, preparing us for what's coming. This is going to be awesome. And then the other thing he did was he prayed. And we love to encourage you, if you, just, if you need some structure to your praying, we love to use the word acts. Prayer acts. Okay? It acknowledges and adores God. Secondly, the C is it confesses sin and it confesses the promises of God. T, it thanks God. It recognizes God for what He has done. And that gives us faith for what He's going to do. And yes, it's the big word supplication. This is the big ask of God. Supplication means to, to ask God. You do not have because you do not ask. You have small because you ask small. If we ask big, we might get big. If we ask according to the will of God, we shall have what we ask because we ask according to His will and we know that He hears us. So this is Acts, and when we look quickly at what Nehemiah did, this is the pattern he followed. Okay, he starts like this. Once he's been moved, once he says he's praying and fasting, this is what he says. He prays Acts. First of all, he declares, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, loyal to your covenant and faithful to those who love you and obey your commandments. Right, so he starts by making God big. Listen, if you've got a big vision, you believe in big, you better have a big God you believe in big for. Amen. We like that song that we introduced today. And this is all about making God great. Some of our mountains are so big because our God is so small. Right? 
Some of us are looking at the big giants and, and we have a little God. We need to get a view of God and then the big giant will be a small giant in the eyes of our big God. Come on. So he does this. He acknowledges. He adores. He, he, the second thing he does is he confesses sin. He says, we have sinned. Um, uh, I confess our sins, he says, including myself, my father's family, we've committed against you. We've acted weakly, wickedly because you were, have not, we have not obeyed your commands, decrees, laws you gave. So he confesses sins. Thirdly, he confesses the promises of God. He says, they are your servants, your people, whom you redeem. And he, he says, God, you, are, you, you, you redeem these people. They are your servants. You will keep your covenant with them. You said you would. I mean, sometimes you need to know what, not sometimes, all the time, you need to know what is written. What is it that you will confess? And then he makes the supplication. He says, God, man, I've seen, I've wept, I've mourned. This thing has moved me. God, I want to make a difference. He says in chapter 2, these great words, here I am. But before that, he's fasted, he's prayed, and he asks God, God, give me favor with this king. And let him grant my requests. He asks big, man. He goes in that, into that king's chamber. He's like trembling, but he's asked God. And God gives him favor. And 52 days later, friend, the wall is rebuilt. A miracle has happened because he's asked big and he lived moved. 